Hi. In my last video, last week, I explained how we humans are fully capable of a society of free people who do not and cannot oppress each other. In this video, I want to talk about some of the likely benefits of such a society. The benefits of freedom. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. On the one hand, freedom is the whole purpose of the revolution, at least to me, anyway. And the word means more than one thing to people, but I think it could be defined for this video as being able to do what you want without hurting others. That's a good enough goal, certainly a good enough working definition. In capitalist society, we have a small amount of freedom to pursue some things we might be interested in, but we're also very restricted in those pursuits because we might not have enough time or money. Again, this is all in my video on how free we are, uh, which you can see here. And if we eliminated all those sources of our oppression, we could do what we wanted to do. I think that alone is a good enough reason for us to do it, for us to have a revolution. But maybe it's not enough for people. Other than just doing what we want, what are the consequences of freedom? Because we've been made to fear them. We've been brought up to believe any freedom beyond the token rights we supposedly have would be dangerous. You can't trust each other with freedom. You can only trust self-appointed authorities with power. Hmm. <laughs> Doesn't make sense to me, but that's how we've been indoctrinated. We're conditioned to give a knee-jerk reaction to anything considered radical or extreme. Radical freedom? No thanks. I'll keep my watered-down slavery, thank you. But for those of us who are interested in living in a radically free society, what would some of the benefits be? One way of thinking about it is to start at the other end. Imagine, say, a, a totalitarian system, a situation of some kind, maybe like a slave plantation or a jail, you do what you're told to do, however it makes you feel. You're under the threat of punishment at all times. This condition is just as much a lack of freedom as it is a lack of justice and equality. In this case, they're all kind of the same thing. Each one's a precondition of the other. As a slave or a prisoner, you are not in the same class as the people you're working for. A few people have all kinds of privileges, and you have none. So you'd be exhausted every day, unhappy, stressed, with no opportunities to learn anything, really, or to express yourself. So you'd be continually frustrated, too. You'd likely be in a state of permanent hypervigilance, always anxious about the next incident of violence against you or someone you care about, or even wondering if you'll ever even see them again. And that situation is quite familiar to many people, even today. Now let's imagine the slaves, or prisoners or whoever, but we're going to say the slaves, get together and decide to rebel. They kill or they chase off the slavers and they take over the plantation and run it for themselves. Yes, for sure, people would try to invade them and take it back and re-establish slavery into hierarchical society. But maybe, let's say, they succeed in establishing a lasting freedom. They're no longer told what to do by people who don't have their best interests at heart. So they can do what they want. They're no longer under constant threat of violence. So their work, their actions, their thoughts no longer cause them stress. 
they would still get unhappy for one reason or another. That's part of the human condition. But the causes of constant stress and fear and anger and frustration would be gone. Sometimes slaves and prisoners think that's the way of the world and they recreate oppressive conditions after they escape, but with them on top. That's unfortunate. That's what happens when you liberate your body, but not your mind. They could recognize that the belief that we have in this society that we're of unequal value and some people should be on the top is wrong-headed. They could have true democracy, making decisions as equals, working for and taking care of each other. Being able to make your own decisions is empowering. It makes us more mature and independent. And it means we can become the people we want to become without having to make way for someone else's ambitions. Many societies in the world are composed of people who have escaped or consciously protected themselves from states and empires. They usually have aversion to rulers built into their cultures, into everything from their agricultural practices to their religions is woven a suspicion of concentrated power. There are a couple of books you can read on this subject in the description. They're pretty interesting. Free people need to maintain a level of vigilance against anyone who might try to reestablish a social hierarchy. But what if they could keep it up? What if the free, fair, and equal society they created lasted into the long term? What would be the benefits of that? Let's start with work. Under capitalism, as under slavery, the owners take the entire product of the workers' labor and give them back the minimum they can get away with. Most of us work at jobs we don't like, jobs that are boring, tiring and unfulfilling, but necessary to survive. We live in fear of losing our jobs because, as bad as they are, they're better than starving in the street. We're stressed, we're anxious, we're cooped up in offices and factories. This kind of situation has caused an epidemic of mental illness. A free society wouldn't have those problems. First, we would have the full product of our labor, and we could pool our labor and create vastly more prosperity for ourselves than we have at the moment. Remember, there are trillions of dollars sitting in offshore bank accounts right now, wealth created for and taken by a few thousand people who could not possibly spend it all. Think how many houses, hospitals, and computers, and, and whatever else you want, could be built with that wealth, or could have been built if that money had not been taken from us in the first place. The scarcity that we know today, the artificial scarcity caused by bosses and landlords, would be gone. Second, we would no longer have to do any of the menial, soul-crushing tasks of jobs we hate. All the stress, the anxiety, the boredom would be a memory. If no one wants to do it, it won't get done. And I know some people who, of course, think that's why uh, people should remain poor and dependent so they can be forced to work for us. And that is a very elitist way of thinking. If it needs to be done, maybe we can automate it. We can focus on automating the worst jobs. The reason we don't automate those jobs nowadays is it's still more profitable to hire poor people and pay them subsistence wages. If there were no poor people, because we share the abundance of what we create, we'd all have an interest in automating those jobs that are, that are like necessary but unpleasant. And if that's impossible, will share the work. The whole idea of work would change. We wouldn't apply for jobs and wait for wages. 
we would do the things we want to do, maybe because they're necessary, and maybe just for fun. You wouldn't have a job. You might teach local kids how to read, grow cucumbers, and make music. We need all those things, but it would be your choice. Because we wouldn't have to work long days for minor compensation, we would have a lot more freedom to pursue our interests. Moreover, since we also wouldn't be working in competing firms on redundant research projects, we could pool our resources and research. In fact, if scientists weren't forced to work for whoever has the money and to make them more money, they could pursue whatever kind of science they liked. I would expect that would translate to more research on, like, real problems, and less on baldness cures. I think freeing scientists from paying bills and writing grant applications and following non-disclosure agreements would ramp up the rate of scientific discovery and technological development. But still, it would be up to them. So that's work. What about violence and security? A free society would be a largely peaceful one. There are many causes of violence, and some of the most common causes would not exist if we were truly free. The state is the main cause of violence in society. It doesn't look like it on the surface, but it is. And it's not just in outright killings by police or soldiers, which amount to millions of deaths. It's in the constant threat of violence for breaking any of its laws, or not paying rent, or not paying taxes, or getting your taxes wrong, or not having the right papers, or just saying how you feel about it all. State violence keeps the corporation together and takes huge amounts of wealth from us and gives it to them. That violence also includes intellectual property which ensures only people with decent incomes can afford the medicines that they need. But even, even interpersonal violence would probably decrease significantly. Remember we're talking about a society that has made a conscious choice to be free, which means the people respect each other as equals. You wouldn't bully people coerce them, abuse them, or deny them medical treatment. You wouldn't treat them differently just because of their race, religion, or financial status. Parents would learn not to hit their children. We'd have strong communities to intervene if someone is abusing their partner or their kids. We might have a database of predators to watch out for and mutual support to stop them if they come round. In an egalitarian society where laws are not made and enforced by a single central authority, people are equally empowered to uphold the norms of society. They have equal legitimacy in stopping bullies and slavers and warlords. They don't need to wait and hope the police do it for them. So that brings us to justice. What does justice look like where people respect each other mutually and take care of each other? Well, for one thing, people would be more compassionate. To have achieved a free society, they would have needed to recognize imprisonment is only appropriate when absolutely necessary to prevent harm to others. And that things like solitary confinement, torture and the death penalty are cruel and unnecessary. For another thing, justice would not be dispensed from a central authority who makes all the decisions. It'd be made by the people affected by the violence. And I say violence because crime implies broken laws. Violence is a violation of another person's body. There wouldn't be thousands or millions, really, 
of complicated laws that could only be understood by experts and which criminalize all kinds of victimless pursuits. There'd be simple rules and norms and local councils to consider what to do. Reconciliation will be much more common, as it is in other free societies already. They might force the guilty party to compensate the victim somehow. Either way, dispute resolution would be simple. Justice wouldn't cost all your money and time like it does today. What about the environment? At present, we have little power over any of the major polluters because they're huge corporations, and we don't have much opportunity to reduce our dependence on them and their fossil fuels. Markets are skewed by subsidies and laws. If there were no markets, we could use whatever is available, like solar. Markets indirectly hurt the environment in other ways. Thanks to their perverse incentives, we get meat from factory farms, which are terrible for animals and terrible for land and rivers for miles around. We import food at huge carbon output instead of making it locally. Scientists and engineers could find ways to reduce emissions from all our vehicles, and there would be no lobby groups making laws to hold back new technologies. Whole cities might go car-free. A militant population would encourage such changes. It would also do more to protect fragile ecosystems. It wouldn't rely on a central authority to say which ecosystems are okay for destruction for someone else's profit. People already want to be stewards of parks, wetlands, mountains, lakes, and so on. Indigenous people have been doing it for thousands of years. If there are no corporations and no police, protecting threatened ecosystems would be much easier. The profit motive would no longer exist, so overfishing and clear-cut logging would probably stop. If there were mutual aid support networks and strong communities, we wouldn't need to have more children with a view of their taking care of us as we age because anyone could take care of us. If there were no poverty, people would not have to live in substandard housing full of lead, asbestos, and fire hazards. And the devastating environmental effects of war would be gone too. As a teacher, I would love to talk about education, but I've already made a whole video on what that would look like, which you can see here. So let's wrap this up. Freedom brings all kinds of benefits. We'd be happier, more comfortable, more mentally and physically healthy. We'd make our own choices about how to spend our time. So we'd have time to have fun and relax and see and take care of the people we love. If we needed help, it would be available. We would make decisions together, but also offer the maximum freedom for individuals to go their own way. Yeah, it still wouldn't be a perfect utopia. I don't know how to get there. But I think this is a vision worth working toward. I can imagine some other benefits of a free society, but then so could you. What else would be better if we were free? And what am I wrong about? Tell me what you think in the comments. See you next week.